We're talking about the Guitar Hero with Pat McCormick next on Retro Serial. Hey everyone, welcome to Retro Serial. I'm your host, Ian C. I'm glad you could be joining us for today's program. On today's program, we have Pat McCormick, returning guest, yes, from the golden rage of TV. If you have not yet gone and subscribed to his channel, it's right here on YouTube. Please go and subscribe to his channel. Check it out. He has some awesome content and some awesome videos and awesome trivia about the golden age or rage of television. Pat, being a guitarist for something like 40 years, as he mentions on today's program, uh, I had him on because we're talking about guitarists and guitar heroes, our favorite guitarist, our least favorite guitarist, and oh, everything in between, underrated guitarists, all that good stuff. We're going to talk about that today. But before we get to that interview, please do me the honor of subscribing to my channel. It would really mean a lot to me if you subscribe and hit the like button that lets people know about the great content here. And if you're interested in knowing when this stuff comes out, please hit the bell notification and share it on your favorite social media. Let other people know about this great content as well. And also, if you want to donate some of your hard-earned cash and part with it, you can always follow the link below to the Buy Me A Coffee page where you can do exactly that. Donate some of your money to make all my wildest YouTube dreams come true and build this YouTube mogul empire. All right, well, with that said, let's get to the program. Well, maybe not that exactly. Let me just pause for just a second and just say, um, I think there might have been a little tiny bit of cursing. I try to keep this as family friendly as possible, but uh, there might have been like a little bit of cursing, a little, or skirting the edges of some words that, uh, oh well, I'll let you figure it out. Just as a heads up, it's a warning. The other thing is, is there are some surprises on bands we like, bands we don't like, and uh, don't be too sensitive. Just don't be too sensitive about it, okay? It's just an opinion. We all, we've all got him. And uh, if, uh, if he said anything that you dislike, well, send it to him, not to me. And if I've said anything that you dislike or, you know, the like, oh, I can't believe you said that about my favorite band. Well, uh, well, what can I say? I mean, we all have an opinion. Uh, it's, it's music, it's taste, it's all that stuff. But whatever, leave it in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And now with all that said, let's get to the program. Uh, all right, yeah. everyone. I am on a Zoom call with Pat McCormick from, and now I always say retro TV because that's what your shirt said, but it's not retro TV. Tell no. me what it is again. Well, retro TV is actually a network. Um, ah. Whereas my brand is retro TV trivia from the golden rage of TV. The golden rage of TV, which is a play on kind of a rage against the machine or something like that, because you do a lot of guitar stuff. Well, actually, <laughs> no, it was more of a, well, yes. Actually, the way it began was me uh, performing uh, classic TV themes a la rock guitar. Right. And it worked really, really well. Um, that was where we put the rage into the term. Mm. The golden age of TV would be, the, you know, the golden age of television. <clears throat> and I thought, well, since this is our hard rock version, versions of these classic themes, we'll call it the golden rage of television or the golden rage of TV is what it became. Yeah. Well, that, is, that is what my YouTube channel is called, Golden Rage of TV. And right. <clears throat> Just to get that out there. Just to get it out there. I mess it up every time. I've been on the show three times. You think the first time I, you know, you give me a pass the first time. The second two times, I don't deserve a pass. I just look at the the crest on the thing and that, that for some reason that stuck in, that sticks in my head. Then I go a little later and I go, oh, okay. Right. 
Yes, but you are a shredding guitarist, a very good one at that. I love listening to your uh, themes that you do, but that's not the only thing that you do with the guitar. And today I'm going to have you on the show because today we are talking all about guitarists, talking all about our favorite guitarists our least favorite guitarist. We're going we're to try not to be too negative, but uh, there, I, I, I can't help but get negative when it comes to music. I have my opinions on it and stuff. And, uh, and uh, say that again. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> I have my favorite. I have my least favorites and all those things we're going to be talking about today. So you fooled me at the very beginning when we were on, we can just jump right in here. I'll put you right on the spot because your shirt says, it looks like it says Jedi or, uh, or Judas priest, but it actually says Jedi priest, right? Yeah, it is the Judas priest logo, but with the Jedi fighter. And I thought it was just the coolest. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is. Now, do you have a tough time choosing between uh, KK Downing and Glenn Tipton? Boy, right to those guys, huh? Um, no, I don't. Glenn Tipton was the band. And, and so in that way, I have a much higher respect for him as a writer and as a soloist. And that's not the call of K.K. Downing a slouch. He certainly wasn't. And what was it about Judas Priest? The blend of these two guitarists mm -hmm. made them one great guitarist. Yeah. So it wasn't standalone greatness as much as it was listen to the sound that these two guys are getting on tape. Mm -hmm. And what made me become an enthusiast of hard rock itself and many other people, I might add, was their Screaming for Vengeance album. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a great one. Which had that's... their big hit, Another Thing Coming. You yeah. know, and that's a great tune. Oh, and so's every single other song on it, which is, again, very <laughs> seldom. But it was the tones, the tones that these two gentlemen got out of those martial amps was... Uh, it, it set the standard and I will go so far as to say it hasn't been matched since. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, one of the things with those two is they're not at odds with each other. You know, they're not, uh, it's, it's one of those things where if you have a really good guitarist, it's difficult for him to have another really good guitarist with them. You know, it's, and, and with those two, it did not seem like they were at odds with each other at all. It seemed like they they were you know good friends. One person didn't have a problem doing half the solo, and then the other person doing half the solo. It wasn't a matter of harmonies. And yeah, they, you know, what they did was they complemented each other. That's that's really what it was. Right. There was just no separation between the two. They were that one force of rock guitar. That was uh, again. They are what got me into hard rock. Right, it right. Wasn't, I wasn't into hard rock prior to that. I was mm -hmm. very, kind of leaned more towards the poppy kind of stuff. You know, uh, we're talking about rock guitarists. I've been playing for about 40 years and I've had some success and, you know, some notoriety. And I, I, I try to think back what made me go on that journey where I would be putting tens of thousands of hours in on the instrument. And that is, I did the first 10,000 hours to become an expert. I did the next 10,000 hours to become world-class. And, yeah. and, you know, it was worth it because I loved it, you know, and, but I, what made me start doing that? And it was this one time that my brother was cool. Now, my older brother says, okay, you and I are going to the record store because I know you're interested in learning how to play the guitar. And here's where the, I, I I'll tell you, I've known my brother all my life and this was the single most cool thing, maybe the only <laughs> cool thing he ever did was he took me into that record store and he gave me an education. He went and grabbed Montrose, the album. He then went and grabbed Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush, Okay. He then went and grabbed Jeff Beck blow by blow. 
He then went and grabbed Robin Trower Bridges Size. Mm -hmm. He then went and got Pat Travers Making Magic. These all were monster guitar players. This was the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And I went home with a stack of LPs for my birthday. And it was like, okay, I'm going to explore these guys. And it was at that point where I did gain an appreciation for the harder edge rock guitar. And that was from the Montrose album. Huh. That was it. That was, the, that was one of the births. He was almost the birth of hard rock guitar. And it's such an influential man, Ronnie Montrose, who I later played in a band with for four years. Talk about an honor. Yeah, no kidding. A guy that I, that I cut my teeth learning how to play like but in learning more about the history of great rock guitarists i i had gone back and i just i was just in the car with my daughter and the beginning of brown eyed girl by van morrison came on <laughs> and i went delana you know who that is uh -huh. oh, I was like, that's ronnie montrose so his session work for all these great great artists was beyond belief. But when he found Sammy Hagar and formed Montrose, it created this. What is this? And how many pans that it influenced? I couldn't even go, I couldn't even begin to say, except that the most prevalent two were Van Halen and uh, uh, Aerosmith. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, God, I was in a band with that guy. Yeah. Okay. Always that impressive? Yes, yeah. he was. And he always well, serious, impressive for you. You know, I mean, you, you, you're like you said, you're honored. This is a hero of yours. You're looking up to. Um, exactly. Let's. I mean, you know, you you mentioned the list of guitarists. There, some of them I don't know. Some of them I do know. Obviously, when we talk about Jeff Beck, and then uh, you know, when you talk about Sammy Hagar. Um, wh what do you think? They, they seem to be those real solid guitarists. Uh, with with minimal flash, able to do flash, but minimal flash. But obviously, when we get to the uh, maybe around 78, 79, and certainly when we get into the 80s, we start seeing that flash being featured. Uh, the faster, the better. You're a shredder. You're not a shredder. And if you're not a shredder, then go home. Uh, and I think in, in a couple of ways, I want to talk about somebody who pushed this forward, this, th that kind of narrative forward a bit um, and, uh, and hear what you have to say about it. Because one of my absolute favorite guitarists who I never was able to play like, but I learned tons of his songs was Randy Rhodes. I was less of an Aussie fan as I was an Aussie's guitarists fan. <laughs> so I loved Randy Rhodes and I felt as though, and I, and I could be wrong. I mean, obviously when history changes, it's not just by, it's not just like, Oh, it was all this way. And now it's another way, you know, there's normally a couple streams that flow into some new river. Um, but I did feel as though that Randy Rhodes um, instead of everything previous to that, or most things previous to that had kind of a blues base, background to it with blues based rhythms and stuff like that and 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 solos where he was taking more um um classical guitar right. and shredding it with classical guitar and you know another great guitarist who was blues based who did shred was someone like um uh jimmy hendrix but he was very blues based where you saw randy rhodes being very um classically based but Absolutely. still sh shredding. Yes. Well, so influenced is what I call it. Right? Yeah. Right. Influenced yeah. influence. That's a better word for it. Yeah. But, but he was doing classical, um, uh, not chords. He was doing classical scales and things like that um, in his, in a lot of his solos and things like that. And that kind of fed into Ozzy's little, you know, theatric of yeah, the gothic. bizarre, yeah, gothic kind of thing. So what do you think is a good push forward from those good, you know, good, very solid, could be flashy to where the flashy was, was featured? And what do you think about what I said? If you have any, have any thoughts on what I said too, go ahead. I know I said a lot there. 
Well, no, I mean, that was good. That was it. The, the Randy Rhodes was a game changer. Prior to him, it was Van Halen. And they really were not far apart when it came to, you know, where they came from and the era they were in. Right. It would have been very interesting to see, to have been able to see how far Randy would have gone with it. You know, it's just the most, it's the saddest loss, not the saddest. There's plenty more, but I mean, just one of them. He was cut down. It seemed like right when he was about to just go, you ain't seen nothing yet. People check this out. And so if, if he had lived, we would all be better guitar players. (laughs) <laughs> That's how I feel about it. No, we would. Yeah. Because that influence of all these great players, Van Halen included, um, brought the bar up. And the bar keeps going up. Mm-hmm. And to the point where now seeing a technically out of, out of, uh, a technically super pro, efficient player is normal. It's yeah. Not, it's not, wow, there's Ingve. There's Ingve, and I've never heard anybody play like that before. Now everybody plays like that. Yeah. Not everybody, but unless, listen, they know what it takes to do it, and now, and so they do it. Maybe it's 15,000 hours. Maybe it's 20,000 hours, you know. Um, so I wasn't really so much into the flash myself as much as the <clears throat> singing of the single note. And that's what I miss the most from it. I'm blowing my ears out. I don't do it anymore, but it was being able to take the single string technique, the single string note and sing, Mm -hmm. not write chord progressions and rock out, Mm -hmm. but take that tone and make it say something, sing something. This would be like a Steve Vai. Okay. Or Joe Satriani, which they both came from the same mold basically, but it's, and where did that all come from? And again, I'm not just playing favorites here, but Ronnie Montrose, Open Fire, 1977. Mm-hmm. And there it is, the instrumental rock album. Not the mm-hmm. only one, you know, Jeff Beck had done it, but this was this is what set the precedent of making, he did a, a cover of Town Without Pity. That is one of his all time, you know, it's just the most well-produced piece um that again that's a vocal song so you know there's the best element of where where it was based for me it was based melodically mm-hmm. well the blues which you mentioned the bluesy influence that's in everything mm-hmm. it's it <clears throat> listen there wouldn't be rock without blues oh for sure for sure Many wouldn't and, and in many ways i could show you that they are indeed actually one and the same especially when it comes to soloing the progressions chord progressions would probably be that's where the difference is blues even though i've heard many different types of blues progressions it's still very a very structured you know 12 bar usually thing as opposed to rock which there's no rules Mm -hmm. but the soloing you know is the same that's why Hendrix was able to blend the two so well. You don't know what you were hearing unless it was, well, there's the Red House, right? There's Red House, but man, that don't sound like the blues to me. <laughs> just this amazing shredder guitar player that just, you don't even think blues. You just think he's singing with it. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah. that, that's what I miss the most. That well, well, one one person for me that comes to mind when you think about that taking the note and singing with it, rather than so much shredding with it, uh, for me is David Gilmore. Oh, I yeah. thought David Gilmore is just a brilliant guitarist. He didn't have to be flashy. I mean, I just would sit and listen to, especially the Wall, you know, and listen to him play on the wall was just amazing. It wasn't flashy. It was every note was perfect kind of a thing. So I get that. I had a a guitar player, prominent player to just once tell me, if you can't say it in four notes, you can't say it at all. Yeah, I think that's true. Even if, I think even if you have, 
a lot of notes in between those four notes. And even if they're going fast between those four notes, it really is going to come down to those four notes in between everything else. That connects to the human portion of the audience. And this is kind of why I think, boy, I sound like I'm bragging my ass off here, but I'm not. But what I'm saying is why I had a mixed audience, male, female. Uh huh. It wasn't just the dudes. The dude show who goes and sees the, you know, the monster players. I'm sorry to say, but that's generally what they get at those shows. Right. Not many gals are interested in super guitar players. You know, um, it's it's a boys club kind of a thing. <clears throat> because I wasn't that. I was more of a melody based. Make it scream. Make it cry. Mm -hmm. Growl. Make it do all these things that are going on in my evil little head it resonated with both sexes uh -huh. I got it and it hit, hit them right here rather yeah. than whoa that's amazing wow that's amazing did you see that rip that rip probably is a, a mixolydian flat nine uh, <laughs> flat, you know in other words there's these guys that can stand there and, and technically look at you and you know, mm, mm, that's the reaction Whereas my reaction was more like this. Yeah. More uh, awestruck, more just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that somebody's actually being able to do that with, with a guitar. Well, um, I wouldn't call it awestruck because again, you can see those guys and they won't move you at all, but you'll hmm. still be awestruck at how amazing they play. Mm -hmm. It was more of that guy is not even thinking about what he's playing. It's just coming out of him. Yeah. And Ian, I can tell you there were moments. It wasn't constantly like that, but there were moments where it was like, I am completely connected and I am expressing myself right here, right now. What a great place to be. Um, and and uh, at one. It's so popular. That's why the, you know, the guitar is so popular. It's just a cool instrument, right? but it is the most expressive instrument, hands down. Saxophone kind of comes close to me, but when it comes to being able to... to I might, I might be, be upsetting saxophone players out there, but I hear, I hear what you're saying in making that reference. The difference is, is saxophone is really just a, uh, like almost a soloist instrument where a guitar is, is, you know, you can play the chords, you can play the song and you can play the solo and the melody and all that stuff with a guitar where you just, you couldn't do that with only, um, only a saxophone. Um, Okay, so the melodic. So let's let's move into. So uh, as far as melodic players, we 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 talked a little bit about that. We talked a little bit about some of our favorites, your, your influences there. Let's move into shredders for just a second. I do want to know what are what like what your some of your favorite shredders are. Like you know, when you get into the eighties, especially when you start getting into the mid to late eighties. Um, what, uh, what were some of your favorite shredders and your least favorite shredders? What are the pros and cons of shredding? You know, when you're, when I think of shredders, I think of people, oh, let me just give you a couple of examples. For me, I think of someone like, um, uh, George Lynch, you know, I thought George Lynch was just a masterful guitarist shredder people, but people were pushing it. They're like, well, you, you, you play that fast, but we want you to play faster. And the singers are, you know, well, you sing high, but you sing as high as this guy, you know, kind of a thing. So um, what, what were your, what do you think of, of those shredders? Who, who did you like? Who didn't you like? Okay. And why? Um, at, well, Okay. Shredder, the gap from the classic rock guitar player influencer like Montrose or, or the, the guys that I'd mentioned before to the aspect of the guitar hero or Shredder. It started off as the guitar hero, which is kind of why, why that video game was named that. Um, and for me, the quintessential was Michael Shanker. And most players who are anybody would probably point to him as, if not one of their all-time favorites, 
their all-time favorite. He was mine because he was melodic and a shredder all at the same time. Um, he was this, of course, UFO. Scorpion. Oh, UFO. UFO. And and he, he recorded albums with the Scorpions. His brother was the only real member of the band, Rudolf Shanker. Oh, Michael. okay. I'm sorry. I'm getting the two confused. I just heard Shanker and I was thinking so... Right. So the, the the one shanker was in was in the Scorpions and the other was in UFO. He was originally in the Scorpions, but UFO oh. they went for UFO and UFO went. We want that guy. <laughs> and, you know, again, he's the best. And to this day, he's got to be seventy, and he is still playing like he did when he was when it was the early eighties. So. Again, he was he was he was big for me. Um, <clears throat> then again, as I said, Pat Travers was a very uh, a shredder of, of of to be said. But the, you know, the difference with him is he could sing too. Same with Ma Frank Marino from Mahogany Rush. These guys were the shredders of the late seventies, early eighties, um, and then influenced it into oh, boom! There's Van Halen, and you know, it, he just took over. His, his playing just got better and better, and so did their albums. And it was like, okay, now we're trying to live up to this guy, and nobody could do it. <laughs> nobody can play like that. You know, it was just, okay, there's going to be a lull here, and then you're going to hit about the mid-80s, you know, 85, 86, you know, that around that era. And I just happened to be in Hollywood at that time. So I was kind of had my finger on the pulse of the glam rock um, shredders is where they came. Suddenly there's these great guitar players. You had a great diversity or a contrast, I should say, between a great guitarist like Warren D. Martini. Mm -hmm. where we're at. And, and, oh God, his name's escaping me. How can that happen? I think oh, C. C. Deville. oh, C.C. DeVille from Poison, yes. Oh, no, the, the look on your face is letting me know that we are on the same page uh, with, uh, <laughs> with that. I, 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 I am not a Poison fan almost in any respect, so I get it. People out there, like I, I, I've tried to say this before, I try to stay as positive as possible with certain things, but... Look, I'm just not a Poison fan all around. I mean, almost in anything. I liked Every Rose Has Its Thorn. I'm not saying there, there, it's really difficult when you have a, a band that puts out four or five albums to say there's never going to be one good song on there. Of course, there's going to be one good song, right? I mean, if I shoot out a target long enough, I'm going to hit it. But right. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're good musicians are songwriters or anything but okay so you're contrasting warren d martini to a cc deville and you're saying okay cc deville was uh yeah not not my not my favorite either well it's amazing. Band. it's amazing the the contrast that you could call a rock star you know, they, they were living it. I mean, they were they were up there. A lot of people liked them. I got into a lot of fights in school uh, because I did not like C.C. DeVille. I mean, I wish I could play as good oh, as he I, could. I'd have been there to back you up, Ian. <laughs> yeah, C.C. DeVille? I, I hope you kick their ass now that I think about it. <laughs> but... <laughs> No, I mean arguments, not. Uh, oh, not, oh, okay. Not I real know you're like that. Right? <laughs> this is yeah. best. Don't you forget it. Don't you forget it. Yeah, the well. Oh, man. I can only imagine. Well, <clears throat> yes. And, and I mean, again, I have my favorites. I have my the, the guys that I gravitated towards. And then there was these guys that were put up on a pedestal like CC and. <clears throat> I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble here, but I figure who else better to do it with? Than <laughs> All right. Just, Go on. Just don't pace this. <laughs> I have a problem with Kirk Hammett. Oh, really? I love Metallica. Uh -huh. They are one of my favorite bands of all time. But 
whenever the solo comes on, the volume goes down. Is it because I think he's not a good player? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I think. Okay, everyone, don't 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 write any hate toward me. He's saying it. <laughs> this is one of those places we will disagree, but you didn't like him. I, that's okay. Everyone's got an opinion on this stuff. It's very simple. Watch uh, some kind of some kind of monster. It's the film about them recording and justice for all. It's a movie. Oh yeah, I think I've seen it. Yeah, there's a portion in it where you learn the truth. There's a portion. I, I, I'm lost. I mean, I haven't seen it in years. I remember when that came out. But Watch I, it again, and, and you learn the truth. And what's even better is Lars Ulrich could not be laughing harder in the background, knowing that that is what is going on film, is the truth. Oh, Don't man, get I, me wrong. The man, the man can play. And, he, and what Metallica makes up out of two guitar players is very much like Judas Priest this one huge guitar player. Yeah. But again, for me, solos should have at least some sort of melody to them. Some mm. sort of melody, not just the right notes. Yeah, it, right I, note. okay. I, I get that. I mean, it was a time where you're talking thrash metal and you're talking everything speed and, you know, and Look, Dave Mustaine, I would not say the same thing about. Yeah. That dude rips. Yeah, yeah. And they came from the same band. I mean, I'm just saying. You know, I get it. <laughs> you listen to early Metallica, and you're like, "Who's playing?" This is me. Who's playing that solo? Is that James? And then it'd be like, "Oh yeah, it's Mustaine." Oh no. Oh, so no. again, well, that- were there were there any? Let's let's just get it out of the way right now. We might as well too. We're about half hour into this. Let's just talk about our least favorite players. And I want to talk about underrated players. Okay. So let's talk about our least favorite players. Um, So for you, James Hetfield. No, James Hetfield, I think is a great guitar player. Oh no, I'm sorry. Kurt. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, Yes. I I misspoke. Um, And uh, who, who else? Well, I have you on the spot and we don't like see neither one of us really care for CC DeVille or poison as a band. Right. And so, you know, if you ever wanted to listen to the solos from certain big bands, it's like, okay, well, that guy's not a good guitar player. Uh-huh. Or he is a good guitar player. It just can't solo. When Randy yeah. Rhodes soloed, it was like, oh, my God. Yeah. And you knew exactly who it was, too. Yeah. So there's an aspect of being able to recognize who it is. You know, I don't think Slash is the greatest. Mm-hmm. I really don't. But I really, I, I do like Slash, though. I like him. I think he was more... I, I, I'm not thinking, saying he's the greatest, even though, you know, those polls put him there. To me, <clears throat> he could play melodically. Yeah. The stuff that he would do, even though it was blues-based, it was melodic. Yeah. It wasn't just the right notes. It was the right notes with feeling. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are a few guitar players that would why would they let them solo if they can't put feeling into a song that is so full of feeling that mm-hmm. the contrast and playback who in there who's in there listening to this going my god the black album we have just recorded the greatest heavy metal album ever oh there's the solo again you know it's kind of like the the difference between what was the greatest songs and then, okay, and now we're just going to let this guy play all the notes that he thinks should be there. I never understood that. That And, and so there was a few bands like that. I thought Twisted Sister was a really good band. Hmm. You, you have, uh, JJ. Well, I don't, I, you know, Twisted Sister for me was one of those bands that I didn't really feel had a guitar hero in it. The no. solos weren't weren't overextended, so I didn't really. I, that's not one of those bands that I look back at and go, "Oh, well, there was a guitarist, or there wasn't a guitarist." One of the bands that I really can't stand, and I know a lot of people like them in retrospect, and I think they had a, I think they had a a pretty big, they had a big following when they were out for at least a little while, but I think people are just sympathetic that the lead singer died fairly recently, and that's Warrant. I can't stand Warrant. 
mm-hmm. I can't stand the guy's voice. I don't like their songs. I don't like, I, I just, I, I, you know, I, I, it, it, for me, it's an all around another, uh, glam metal copycat. I don't, I mean, they probably wouldn't see themselves that way, but you know, faster pussycat, uh, that, you know, just another cut, cut right out of the same mold. Let's right. put it on MTV. Let's. Yeah. What a mess. What a mess. And, and, and that's why, you know, Guns N' Roses got that album out just in time because, because of all of that, they yeah. were powerful enough to take it all the way through. And guess what? Here comes Kurt Cobain. And, you know, you want to talk about a guitar player that's no good, right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> but right? he played from the heart. He did. He it did. wasn't just riffs. It uh-huh. wasn't just the right notes. It was his, his approach. You know, the approach is this is going to be wrong and I'm going to make it sound like art. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, it's obviously somebody who's a, a huge Nirvana fan like I am. I do. I well, it was it was he was re he was that was a reaction to the overextended soloist, over high pitched voice vocalist doing his runs and all this stuff, and it really got pieced out to a point where where it didn't become about the song. It became about how it became about the individual person. How good is your singer? Not how does your singer support your song and how good is your guitarist? Not how does your guitarist support your song? Because I don't, I don't want to hear somebody just flat out shred out. You know, I just, I don't want to hear that. It just doesn't, doesn't appeal to me. Um, But it's a perfect example of someone who is not very good. uh Clearly his voice was his talent. Yeah. His writing was his talent. Yeah. But he was taking a solo anyway, damn it. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, his solos were on? just his solos were just the melody. It was just the melody of the right. song. But, but with feeling. Yes. It was something, you know, and just the worst combination of guitar effects you could throw together. And <laughs> what? It was brilliant. And it was brilliant. And he could do it live. And it was like, you know what? You can back yourself up. Mm-hmm live and be that great no big fan too big yeah fan too. um you know i i don't i don't have a lot of my least favorite <sighs> you have some that you know should have been bigger I well can't, let's i can't let's, leave this conversation well no no let's go into it without mentioning brad gillis um because he's a friend of mine or <laughs> was an old friend of mine and he was in the band night ranger uh-huh phenomenal guitar player underrated no because they got rated high and they were all these they were everyone we've been talking about ian has ended up on the cover of guitar player magazine at one point or other right right but yeah. when it came, comes also to my least favorite i also have to claim vernon reed <clears throat> why no i'm not a racist what i am saying is that i loved living color love mm-hmm. Love that band. Yeah. Saw them live and they blew my mind. Yeah. Give that man a solo and you will find me running for the doors as fast as possible. Because again, there was no, there was no feeling to it. It was, it was, that was an interesting band all around. I mean, you know, and, and, and again, yeah, I'm not a racist, I don't have a racist bone in my body whatsoever. <laughs> But I mean, I, I kind of had almost a love-hate relationship with them. I liked them in the sense that they were different. I mean, I yeah. listened to them. I'm like, well, this is some different stuff. And it wasn't that copycat stuff that was just that they were just trying to crank out as fast as possible. But I did feel like his guitar playing was a little, it was more like a, like like it was like, like he was playing a different song. Almost, yeah. you know, it's like <laughs> the singer would sing and then he'd come in and, and I'm like, does that go with that song? Because that didn't sound like that one with that song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Great live band. I was blown away when I saw them. I didn't expect them to be that good. But again, that the soloing was like sticking a cat in a microwave, you know? Right. Uh, that sounds like a, my God, that count. The, Somebody let that poor animal out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I get it. 
it, it was it was just kind of a blitz a double picking you know the 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 fast double picking with uh, very little uh i mean let's just be honest with what it was and then you know people can decide whether or not they like it or don't like it you know you obviously didn't like it i obviously didn't care for it either but what it was was just kind of a double picking quick as fast as you can go um run your fingers across the fretboard hit a note here and there and then back to the mel melody and he, was, was uh, known, he was known for having up to 40 guitar pedals pedals mm -hmm. in line 40 wow <laughs> what, are you, what are you gonna do with those That's a lot. <laughs> yeah but i will say this as a band i endured them because i really oh, like yeah. their their funk flavor Great. and and Great and stuff to it singer. that dude yeah. that dude could belt and they were doing something different. That's back when, you know, things were kind of changing in music and yeah. you had different bands kind of coming out and, and, and bucking against the, the, um, uh, I don't know what, what was being popular and then becoming popular itself. Right, right. Um, we've talked about this before, but it's got, I have to mention this guy because this guy is probably, well, Randy Rhodes is one of my all time absolute favorite guitarists. I tried to emulate him in almost every way when I was trying to play guitar. I never could. I'm, I'm not, I'm not a good guitarist. I'm not. Um, I can write decent music. I can write songs. I, I just, I'm not that good at guitar. I can chord. Um, but uh, one of the people that I think that needs to be mentioned in this is Steve Stevens. And we yeah. talked about him before. I think as far as a guitarist, he was brilliant oh, yeah. i think he was underrated uh of course you know he was playing with um billy idol i don't know, I don't know. he was rated pretty high was you he okay it, you made it on stage with michael jackson oh yeah 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 that's rated. that's 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 true that's true i just i guess when i'm thinking about underrated sometimes when i think about that i think about like me sitting around with a, a room full of friends and we're talking about music not in my group, you know, friends, and not a lot of people would say, oh, yeah, Steve Stevens. It just was one of those people that kind of got brushed over. And well, he was the side man for Billy Idol. That's why. I mean, it wasn't the Steve Stevens band. It was Billy Idol. Yeah, it was Billy Idol. But I thought he did. I thought he was phenomenal. I really did. And then and when he got into his own band, the Atomic Playboys, mm -hmm man and you listen to across the desert sands i don't know if you've listened to that song or not across the desert sands on that atomic playboy where he plays the spanish uh right. guitar the spanish uh classical guitar oh i could i just i couldn't believe how good that song is and how good he is and I always, and you know again he wrote the bulk of those billy idol hits mm -hmm. so he's got a nice house <laughs> oh yeah 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 well um well, also, I mean, the reason why it wasn't as guitar hero, standing out guitar hero stuff is because Billy Idol came from a punk background where that wasn't really a thing. That's against the rules. Yeah, it's against the rules. So you, 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 you know, he's, it's more of a backup kind of thing, but it was masterful. I mean, to me, that was just one of those absolute masterful guitarists. Right, right. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And then, you know, again, there's just... <laughs> There's such a, a easily we could make a six hour podcast out of this, you know, Ian. It's, it, the, the thing was, is that at the time that I was in LA, it was so overly saturated with wannabe rock stars. Mm -hmm. And I had, a funny thing happened to me when I was in my building and I, and I ran into Steve Marriott, who was humble pie. I mean, a mm. legendary rock singer guitar player um and it was funny i didn't recognize him and, I, and he looked at me and, and we're in the elevator and he says so you're a guitar player and i went yeah yeah uh, you too right and he goes isn't everybody <laughs> and I thought that was the most profound thing i and then it was only then after i that i realized who i was just talking to 
<laughs> that was the fun thing about LA in those days, you know. You probably ran into everybody who was trying to be. It's like when it's like in the ninety. Oh, I had some friends that came down here from Seattle in like ninety six, and he said everybody's in a band in Seattle. Yeah. Like everybody's in a band, and, and by ninety six, you know. So it was. I'm yeah. sure in LA during the eighties, everybody was in a band. Well. Well, you had the movie industry too. You probably everyone was either an actor or, or, or in a band. They were either in a band, mm -hmm. which would be very difficult because of the overflow of bands, mm -hmm. which made it very unpopular in a weird way. There were bands, but the fight to get on that whiskey stage or on the Roxy stage, just immense. You had to go through so many channels mm -hmm. that to me, it would have never been worth it for, because of that. Mm -hmm. Add to that, you're in the, in, in the urban, or not the urban, but the, the, the full-on uh, city of trying to bring people together from possibly far distances to get something together as one unit. And I'm like, no way. You know, <laughs> I'm here to learn and then possibly get a big gig. And that's what I was there for. But I wasn't the only one. Yeah. I was one of among tens of thousands and i'm talking about just hollywood <laughs> yeah I mean, there they were with their poodle hair i mean full on just ready to get the gig no matter what it took and i lost gigs because i didn't look strung out enough i mean that's that was what it came down to it's like do you fit the suit mm. I, I had i had actually achieved I shouldn't say achieve, but I had auditioned with Cher enough times. She was doing a rock kind of a thing then to be considered a member of her new band. This was mm. a, a six auditions I went through. It was only then that she asked everybody what sign they were. And, oh, no. And when I said Scorpio, she said, thank you. And the, the, the musical director is looking at me going... You know, if he'd have just warned me, but it was actually him, poor guy, that had sat through, you know, <laughs> six other guitar players and not once asked them what month they were born because it mattered to share. It mattered to share. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How he horrible. Had the, I had the, the drummer for autograph had got the gig with me. Oh, we, really? We became really good friends. And was like, oh, we're going to go out on tour together. How oh, awesome. He got fired too. Oh, no. Because <laughs> he was a cancer. I oh. was a Scorpio. And she's a fire sign. You can't have water signs with fire signs. You, Everybody knows that, I would assume. I, I have no idea. I, I, uh, I've lived my whole life and, I, I, and, and uh, I've never, I've gotten along with people and not gotten along with people. And their sign has never really made well, a difference to me. She was an astrologist. She was into astrology. That was her thing. I don't yeah. know if she still is, but that was at the time. And oh boy, that also showed me what sh this Hollywood thing of being a super guitar player could do for you. Yeah, drive you crazy. It'll make you think, <laughs> you know, make you think you got something, only to find out, oh, you don't fit the suit. Right, right. You have the suit already. If you fit in that suit, you've got the gig. Mm -hmm. if you don't fit in that suit forget it mm -hmm. it was a brady bunch episode just like that well i am going to name some con kind of controversial guitarists some some guitarists that people line up on one side or the other and like kind of pretty much down the middle at least in my well, experience you know what that okay <laughs> You would be, uh, well, everybody's got their fans and their detractors. So, right. I mean, but you know what I mean? Like, like there are some that's just like, there's, there's, you know, 90% is the fans and 1% or, you know, 10% is not right. the fan. And, and then the other way around, but there are some people who are just polarizing for different reasons. Right. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to name a couple of them as I, as I remember and, and, and tell you my thoughts about them, let you riff on them a little bit. Okay. So, okay. The first one's going to be Mick Mars mm -hmm. from Motley Crue. Mm -hmm. When not a shredder, uh, he not he didn't he, he was 
around and came out the same time as uh, you know the 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 kind of bands that had the at least the guitar hero the the George Lynch's the Warren D Martinis the Van Halen's the you know that kind of thing and I've heard people say look he he wasn't but he was a really good solid guitarist and he could he could shred here and there but did just didn't and then I've heard people say no, he was the worst. That was the worst mistake Motley Crue made. Everybody else in the band is awesome. Mick Mars was the worst uh, decision that Nikki Six made. Um, what's your take on Mick Mars? If you would ask me who the number one most underrated rock guitar player is, that's who I would have said. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on um, that. All you got to do is listen to those albums. Uh huh. Just as a guitar player, most guitar players who know what they're talking about will listen to that and go, that is incredible guitar work. It always had been. It stayed that even after he got sick, you'd go see them play live you'd see videos. I'd see videos of them live. He didn't miss a note. He didn't miss a power chord. He was, Mick Mars was the best player in that band. I know the other guys. I know Tommy Lee is a great player too. But when it comes to why Motley Crue sounded as good as they did, despite Vince Neil, hmm. it, it was Mick Mars. Hmm. Sure, Six wrote the songs, and uh, yeah, they're good songs. But it had nothing to do with the way Motley Crue sounded because it's just the bass. Yeah. Sorry, bass players, but bass players, you understand. It's just one note. If it wasn't for the barrage of rock guitar wall of fury coming from Mick Mars, you would not have had that same reaction for Motley Crue, if, at least from the boy audience, you know? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> they later tried to gravitate towards the girls and the girls only. Mm -hmm. you know, but they started off very raunchy rock, dark, you know, they did. They, they, you know, their their stint in what what I would what I would call hair metal was was uh, was limited. It was real, it was really limited. And I, and you know, one of the things I have a, a friend on is on YouTube. His name's uh, Chris, and he does Redbeard videos, and he talks about bands that are mislabeled hair bands. Uh, and and he said that uh, you know a lot of times what they'll do is they'll what they'll have in common is either a look and a ballad. And then from that point on, they're called a hair band from that point on really, you know, it's interesting to me, in my opinion, the, uh, the, the hair, the hair metal album of Motley Crue was not theater of pain. It was girls, girls, girls. Right. Uh, and that is my least favorite album of theirs. So, well, I should, the guitar playing is amazing. Yeah. That is the cut. <laughs> That's is song alone. The yeah, part on that song is so freaking good. Right, right. Well, I was a huge Motley Crue fan when they when they were out. You know, when they were real popular. Um, but I I listened to the music. If they didn't look the way they did on Theater of Pain, I I would have just thought of them as a regular rock band. Yeah. Uh, girls, girls, girls really kind of had that excess party rock sound to it. Yeah. That. Uh, but they didn't, but then they, they butched their look up more. Okay. Right. So there's that guy. There's that guy. Okay. So here's another one. Here's another controversial person, Jakey Lee, because he replaced Randy Rhodes and he won out against George Lynch. George Lynch almost had the part and Jakey Lee won out against their, and who knows if it's the right choice or wrong choice, but either way, good guitarist, not a good guitarist. What do you think? Well, first, let me uh, help you with a little bit of a history lesson. Okay, all right. <laughs> Who actually replaced Randy Rhodes? Uh, the guy from Night Ranger, was it? Brandon yeah. Gillis. Yeah, but... Uh, what it, I mentioned earlier. <laughs> so he's the one that replaced him. Yeah. And some people, well, not really because he didn't do any albums. I beg to differ. The live album, Speak of the Devil. Yeah. Brad Gillis. Yeah. And, shows you how incredible brad was and that was before night ranger was anybody he yeah. took that gig to push night ranger um but then there was jakey lee 
And I saw him first footage of him at the US Festival and was blown away. Yeah. I was just like, this guy has got it, man. Because he was great at that show, as was Judas Priest, by the way. But they, he was great at that show. And, and yes, I would say underrated. You would still see him on the cover of Guitar Player. So, yeah, I, I don't think he was underrated. He's just a he's a divisive individual. Well, all right, Some people right. say, I "Yeah, I know what you mean." Yeah, the, the, the different differing opinions. Um, yeah, listen to "Bark on the Moon." Bark at the bark moon. on the moon. This is the back at "Bark at the awesome. Moon." Tell me that's not a great guitar player. Oh yeah, yeah. And, well, and, you know, he doesn't have any writing credits for that, right. uh, and uh, and that's actually a uh, uh, he he has actually said. I listened to him in one interview where he said, "You know what? I'd trade all my money in from Bark at the Moon if I could just go back and get the writing credits for Bark at the Moon because it was right. it is Ozzy Osbourne." Uh, and I heard from Dave Sundstrom one time that Ozzy actually re-recorded some lines like the, 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 on, on like new releases of Bark at the Moon to exit other players out. So some of the bases and stuff like that are re-recorded with new people. So that it's, those... all Sharon. it's all Sharon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing to do with Ozzy. Well, listen, I mean, Sharon's not the one singing. Ozzy's got to make that final decision. I know, you know, I know where but his she, balls she are. <laughs> he controlled all the, all of it. Yeah, she yeah. Was the manager. She wasn't just the manager. She was his mother. Yeah. So, in a sense, you, you couldn't do anything in that band without getting okayed by Sharon. Right. It is to that. I know it is to this day that, I mean, if he's still able to go out and play. But the point is, is that Jakey Lee was... He, you know, he had a solo career. I worry about these guys. Ian. Badlands. Badlands was, it was a different yeah. band. It was a different band, a good band. I loved it, but uh, very different than what you thought, you know, he would go on to do, at least in my opinion. Right. And they had a deal, you know, it's just, again, <laughs> there's a lot of these guys where I'm like, I hope, I hope they invested in some real estate or something back when they were rock stars you know back when they had money because they're gonna dry up <laughs> i can't imagine you know uh, it's just it's scary what has happened to the industry but um well that's so yeah there's jakey lee who, who else you got uh i uh, so um uh uh S snake and i forgot the guy's name from the, uh, the two guitarists uh, skid from row. skid row yes yeah what about them what do you think i just, I I like Skid Row because they had a great singer. How's that? Yeah, How's yeah, that yeah. I I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I thought they had good songs too, but I didn't think they, yeah. they they didn't have a guitar hero though. That's for sure. No, and yeah. and so, uh, but good for them, in a sense, because you know that to not have a guitar hero when it was the thing to have a guitar hero. You know, good for them. They, they they put their they put their money or they put their time and effort into writing good, in my opinion, good songs and backing up the 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 true talent of the band, which was Sebastian Bach. Yeah, he overshadowed them all, which was, and I mean, not just because he was tall and good looking, but the guy could sing. Hard not to do with that kind of a voice. Exactly. Very difficult not exactly to do. Exactly right. And so, what a wonderful thing for them. You know, I'm glad I'm glad it worked out. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those, where are they now? Where are those dudes now? <laughs> you know, some, there's somebody could tell me, I just hope it's not a soup line. You know? They tour with the sound alike. They tour with the sound alike. Cause somebody who sounds like Sebastian Bach. Right. Right. Uh, okay. So the other one I really am interested in speaking of Ozzy Osbourne is, and that was, this was a big deal for us. Cause I was, I was I was disappointed in and nothing bad about Zach Wildy, but I was disappointed in that, and I didn't care for the albums that came out with uh, Zach. Um, just it just it took a turn, you know. His music took a turn. I felt like you had um, Diary of a Madman and you had um, uh, Blizzard of Oz, and I felt like Bark at the Moon and Ultimate Sin built on that and i felt like the, the one with zach wildy almost turned against it 
it was like it was like a different band almost and i didn't i don't know he's a good guitarist not a good guitarist i know this i didn't care for i didn't care for ozzy osbourne on those albums well and i think you you really hit the nail on the head with the line that you just used which was i don't know if he was a good guitar player or a bad guitar player i don't know what he was okay what more did you need to say right yeah you know who mars is you know who mick mars is right oh yeah 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 you do because there there he is and in your face well, people would say the same thing about zach i would also say that he's overrated I would mm -hmm. also say that he's had just way too much publicity, mm -hmm. you know, the blonde locks and the muscles. All right, yeah. man. But it's still generic, you know, wanting to keep the memory of Randy Rhodes alive and some of his playing. Mm -hmm. um, but nothing that ever made me go like Jakey e. Lee. Yeah. Jakey e. Lee, I went, oh my God, Ozzy's really stepped it up. I know. Yeah. Button it never saw footage of it, but you know, and then there was Randy, and it's mm. like, you know, how do you how do you follow those guys mm -hmm. unless you get somebody that's well just so different you don't know whether he's good or if he's bad. He's not bad, obviously. And in some ways, I know from a person mutual friend that he is in the in the studio, he is a monster. He takes this much time to record his takes. Really? So in that way, he's, he's very, very talented. And, and in that way. But <clears throat> the only way you really recognize if it's Zach is when you hear that thumb yeah. harmonic. Yeah. yeah. That, that's his, that's it. Yeah. Whereas Brad Gillis, you can tell the king of the whammy bar. You, he's playing melodies with his whammy bar. It's yeah. like, that's Brad, that's Eddie, that's Randy. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> oh, Zach. <laughs> uh, any guitarist that uh, that is worth mentioning in a conversation like this before we wrap it up? I got, I do have one, another question for you at the end, but uh, I just, I wanna say before we wrap it up, is there anybody out there that you're like, look, I can't talk about guitars and stuff without saying this person too so go shoot absolutely please look up on youtube the name marcus demel m-a-r-c-u-s e-e-m-l mm -hmm. out of germany we were friends in la during the 80s we were both at the musicians institute together just a wonderful guy the best guitar player I have ever seen in my life mm -hmm. at moments, mm -hmm. most of the moments mm -hmm. we used to jam to a jam tape and trade. We have like four guys in the room and everybody, once it came time for Marcus to solo spontaneously, mm -hmm. we were dumbfounded. And for some <laughs> stupid reason, I always had to come after him. I don't know why I was always in that chair. Because it sucked, oh. <laughs> Paulo Marcus. It sucked because what you just heard was a spontaneous, melodic expression of the most beautiful hard rock solo and guitar playing you've ever heard in your life. And he's still doing it. He's got a wow. band called the Blue Poets out in Hamburg, Germany. He is rated highly by the European guitar community. Um, I'd like to say he's even a bigger star than I think he is. What I know he is, is a good friend, but still every time I see him at one of his videos or just every time I see him, I'm covered in goosebumps because he's that good. He, he's made me cry. And very wow. few guitar players have actually brought tears to my eyes mm. listening to them play. Mm. Marcus, that guy, he will be a fan. I guarantee it. So what about, uh, see, this is, uh, this is going to get me into a little bit of trouble because you mentioned this before. I don't care for it. I really don't, but I respect it because I know they're great guitarists. 
but I don't, I don't sit and listen to an album and that's just guitars. I, I don't, you know, the Steve Vai albums, the Joe Satriani albums where it's just, although Joe Satriani, you will hear him singing from time to time. Um, but I, it, for me, it's one of those situations where I, I can't get into it. Um, uh, it's almost like uh, g- guitars for guitarists to a degree. Um, right. But it loses me, you know, personally. And right. not to say, because I thought, you know, like, for, for example, Steve Vai is one of my favorite guitarists. And I thought he did great when he played with uh, David Lee Roth on, uh, you know, on, on David Lee Roth's solo career. Mm-hmm. But, I, but I got his, his, one of his tapes. I don't know which one it was. Uh, I'm not, I don't even know how many he, he, and I listened through it once and I was just like, okay, I'm done. I'm yeah, done. Yeah. So right. what do you think about guitar only bands kind of thing where there's no singing where you get, I think the only two people that come to my head is Joe Satriani and Steve Vai when it comes to that. Right. Right. Well, there's me, <laughs> 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 but you know what? Even I, as an instrumental instrumentalist knew I wasn't a great singer. So this is how I'm going to sing. But even then I was like, I don't want just these aficionado dudes coming to my shows. I want a bigger audience. Right. Right. That's when I made the decision to remake classic TV themes. Oh yeah. 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 That's because, well, it gives you a premise to, to, to base all of this album of what you're listening to. We're on. playing those songs in our head as you're playing them though. We're not, I mean, I, I don't think of it as just guitar. I think of it as, oh, he's playing the guitar to that song that I know that has a really good melody to it, you know, as right. well. So that's kind of what I think about th- that. But I just I like, st- like the Joe Satriani album. I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't get into it. It's just yeah. all guitar, the whole thing. That's it. It was just, wasn't wasn't my my forte so i i prefer full band experiences and you know um there's there there's very few i mean uh, paul gilbert had uh racer x they were uh, uh i think they were instrumental and they were mm. the best guitar players ever and, yeah you know, and it was like no i'm not gonna go to a single one of their shows because i don't literally know one of their songs unless there's suddenly a melody there <laughs> right right <laughs> like oh there it is there's that right. song um steve vi steve vi was the only other guitar player to put me in tears yeah just certain ballads that he could do and great bring bring so much expression out of the instrument that it moved me yeah but you're right as a put it as in a whole space. album i can i can listen to a song and enjoy it but as a whole album it's it gets a little Yes. Just a little grading on you to listen give to me, a whole give album me of just for give me yeah. give me Julie's Iron Maiden, you know, oh. give me these songs, give Iron me Maiden, these, yes. these, these hard rock songs that have incredible vocal lines. Right, you know? right. No, they're not great guitar players. That doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter because as a unit, yep, they're huge. You know, mm-hmm. and so yeah, I I. Uh, I, 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 there's my opinions. And I, I, I think we're both on the same page with, you know, if it's nothing but guitar, it does get boring after a while. Yeah. And, you know, it's like Montrose's albums, the instrumental ones, though, were, you could listen to them as an album. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't wait to the next song because I know that next song, <laughs> as opposed to, there weren't some, he didn't do all of that. I mean, there were songs that we played where the audiences was like, huh where's rock candy you know come on rock the nation you know bad motor scooter where is it you know <laughs> we finally get to that and the place would come unglued yeah you know, because there were vocal songs and guess who got to sing them <laughs> uh, you <laughs> yeah i got to do my sammy hagar honest to god oh that's all right that's it good was man. Awesome. yeah it right was awesome, you know and so well, we could talk yeah. about a lot of the. We could talk about Blackie Law. You know, people are coming to mind: Blackie Lawless, uh, Chris Holmes. There are tons of people uh, that come to my my mind uh, as far as guitarists that I thought were decent and uh, dividing. Last question, though, for real, and this is: uh, any guitarist out today that um, that 
that you uh, that that are worth listening to. You know, like are a band that you know their guitarist is it's got a guitar hero in it. You're like, yeah, that guitarist there. Anything? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, seven. Uh, what's it called? Avenged Sevenfold. Oh, it's Avenged Sevenfold. Okay. Yeah. That dude could play, man. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember remember what his name is, but I remember the band. It was another great guitar player. It was the guy in Hoobastank. Um, I don't remember his name either. Uh, but but currently, again, I think Avenged Sevenfold. Um, oh gosh, my son listens to a lot of these cats, and I, you know, I'm not big into the screamo. Yeah, uh, I'm not into screamo either. I like alternative. I but... Have a melodic thing. You can you can throw it in. You know, mm-hmm. as kind of like a bridge or something. But if it's all that, I'm done with it. You know? Well, Screamo has the same problem. It's just like, I mean, you got a song, then you have a guy just kind of blurting lyrics and not really singing. It's just so like, angry. I, I, I'm yeah. already angry. I don't need to be more angry, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, Calgon, take me away. You know, it's like, <laughs> Jesus, what? that's murderous. I don't, I don't dig that. You know, I, I like the Hetfield. <laughs> right. I like that. But I, don't like I don't know if you've heard of uh, she. She mostly just does covers, and it is all instrumental. But but again, because it's a cover, you kind of hear the song, the whole song in your head. But her name is Gabriella Qu- Quiverdo. I don't know if you've heard her or not. She, if you I listen, to that name. <laughs> it's Gabriella nine seven nine seven. She's a uh, a phenomenal guitarist. I mean, just a, an absolute phenomenal guitars young gal too young i mean young young gal like, Isn't that a funny? like 20 <laughs> 20 maybe something like that and i'm looking at some of these videos she looks 20 now i'm looking at some of these videos they say like five years ago i'm like whoa okay so what was she like 15 or yeah. something like that uh she's really good i mean if you if you just like listening to it's mostly acoustic kind of stuff but she does really she did a she does covers uh she does some um uh Pink Floyd covers. She does some. I mean, she just does different covers. I mean, really good though. I sug- uh, highly suggest her. Um, as far as bands for me, as far as that are out now that have a guitar hero to them, I really don't know. I know that there are bands out there that I like, but that guitar hero uh, idea is just it's not as it's not as prevalent as it was in the seventies and eighties. So I can't think of any. I can think of good guitarists like her, um, but I just can't think of the guitar hero kind of thing. So well, it what happened too is the solo in these songs went out of style after a while. Oh yeah. There was just it was a rock song, and you're like, okay, then there's going to be a guitar solo, right? Uh-huh. Nope. Wrong. Nope. <laughs> People pilots uh, these these you know grunge era hard rock bands was like, no, we don't need a solo. Mm-hmm. What we need is to convey the song. And yeah. I just I thought to myself, if only Metallica had used that concept. It'd be more, yeah, okay, all right. And that is where we are going to end today. Pat, nice. Pat, please <laughs> tell tell everybody where they can find you. Well, I'll have to get through all my cease and desist emails that I'm about to get for that, but <laughs> don't get me wrong. I like Kirk Hammett. He serves. Yeah. Um, but that said, uh, I am, I'm Pat McCormick at the Golden Rage of TV. You can find me on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram at Golden Rage of TV and on Twitter uh, at Golden Rage of TV one. So that's me. That's where I'm at. Okay. All right. Uh, Go subscribe. Are you up to a thousand yet on subscribers? Uh, No. You're close though. With uh, YouTube. YouTube is, uh, well, I'm working on a third season for the retro TV trivia right now. Oh yeah. So I'm not posting. I'm not putting up fresh posts. So it's, it's leveled off and that's fine because I am kicking it on on Twitter. So Mm. it's, you know, it's a, it's kind of like what, what format will be kind to me this month or this year. And listen, (laughs) it takes a bit of time to get to that point of actually making a monetary success out of these things. You know, we'll keep going as long as we got that, inspiration of dave sundstrom we'll keep going and we got to get you back on the show you got to come to one of the live these days 
the I lives. wasn't able to make the last one. He invited me, and it's like next time, next time, because it's just been, it's been crazy. It's so. been crazy. I get it. I get it. We talked off air. So, well, stay with me though. Well, I am trying to get to a thousand subscribers right now, and you can help by pushing that subscribe button and pushing the thumbs up button. It costs you nothing, and it means the world to me. It really does. And if you're listening to this on podcast form only, well, thank you for listening. I don't care how you're listening, YouTube, podcast, whatever. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but if you are listening to it on podcast, give me a rating and a review. Those That means a lot to me. If you can say something nice, if you can't say nothing tonight, then don't say anything at all. Uh, no, whatever you want to say, for real. I mean, I, I I am open also to, like, I mean, I want to make this better. So if there's something that's going on, you say, hey, do this. I am not above reproach as far as that is concerned. Um, also, share it on your favorite social media. And if you want to part with some of your hard-earned cash to help me grow this YouTube mogul empire, please donate to my Buy Me a Coffee page where where I will use your money to make my dreams come true. It really means a lot to me. And what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Uh, if you have a podcast out there, listen, well, seriously, if you're a podcaster or you're a YouTuber, it doesn't matter to me if your channel's big or small or whatever. And you like talking about music, arts, entertainment, especially about growing up Generation X, uh, contact me. I would love to have you on the show. I am always looking for guests to talk about cool stuff. Uh, and, uh, and I would, and if you want me on your show, I'm more than happy to be on anybody's show. I'm really not doing a whole lot other than trying to make this work. So thank you very much. And, uh, keep listening to retro serial. <laughs>